All right, man, peace. So basketball legend Michael Jordan recently had an interview with the Cigar Aficionado magazine. And he stated his perspective on the NBA super team phenomenon. He basically stated that he does not believe that it's good for the league, competition-wise or financially. And uh, he basically said that, that you have two great teams and 28 garbage teams. So they're going to talk about it. Of course, I'm going to chime in. Antonietta, thank you. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Meanwhile, guys, the GOAT says super teams are hurting the league. Oh, Max Kellerman, please talk to me. This takes so much nerve by Michael Jordan. Look, Michael Jordan is the greatest athlete in the history of American team sports. I agree with that, and I don't think that it's particularly close. And it ain't close. Forget about just the NBA. There's never been a Michael Jordan, one of a kind, the top, number one. But for a while, he was also the Michael Jordan of bad owners. I mean, his team stunk. So this takes a lot of nerve on two counts. One, Mike, you had... Pippen and Grant and shooters everywhere you look and the best coach in the league. And then when you lost Grant, you came back and got Rodman. Well, the Bulls never had a super team. Um, they had a super player. And, you know, you, you have a lot of guys um, who like to engage in the Jordan versus LeBron or Jordan versus Kobe argument or debate, which is only a debate in their own mind. And they'll say similar things like, you know, Jordan had shooters everywhere and he had Hall of Fame players. No, Jordan only played with two other Hall of Famers. He played with Scottie Pippen and he played with Dennis Rodman. And um, those of you who remember the last two seasons that Dennis Rodman was with the Bulls, he was a wild card who couldn't be trusted, especially that last season. Um, you know, I saw a comment from uh, a brother who, who, was, who I could tell actually watched the last season, the 97-98 season, because he stated facts. He, he, he stated that Pippen was injured most of that last regular season for the 97-98 season. And Rodman was, you know, Rodman was not somebody who was dependable. And those were facts. And, and that game six in Utah between the Bulls and, Utah, and uh, the Jazz, uh, in which, you know, Jordan, of course, crossed over uh, Brian Russell and hit that jump shot. People forget Scottie Pippen had to take a, a needle in his spine just to get out there on the floor and be a decoy. And Dennis Rodman was, you know, just totally bugging out of his mind. Uh, you know, that Bulls team provided a framework of order for him because he was plunging into a lot of, of uh, you know, he was plunging into a very chaotic mind state, which was going to get even worse after he left Chicago. So, I mean, th this, this narrative that they try to promote about how Jordan played on a super team, that's just not the truth. Uh, Horace Grant was, a, was, a, was an effective power forward who was very good defensively a very good offensive rebounder, and could make a, a 10 to 12 foot jump shot. He's not a Hall of Famer. Right? He was a nice player who at his best was, was pretty good to borderline good. You know, guys like B.J. Armstrong and Steve Kerr, you know, the, the shooters that Max Kellerman is referring to, um, they were very effective shooters in that offense because of the attention that, that Jordan garnered, especially when he was in low post. But that team was, was basically built around the system that was implemented by Phil Jackson and Tex Winter. And it, re it revolved around the greatness of Jordan. It really maximized his greatness because in clutch moments, you know, before, they installed, before they installed the triangle, it was very easy for intelligent teams like the Detroit Pistons or the Boston Celtics to kind of uh, cordon Jordan off and, um, and you know, just, just indulge him in his incessant need to try to take over the game down the stretch because he, he didn't trust his teammates. So he would just go one on five. Now, after Phil Jackson brought in the triangle and, you know, Jordan raised his level of understanding of the game and he learned how to trust his teammates, that's when, you know, that's when he, he blossomed into the champion that he's known as today. But no, Michael Jordan never played on a super team. If you want to know what a super team is, then you have to look at Bill Russell's Celtics in the, in the 60s. Uh, you know, the early 70s L.A. Lakers with with, um, with Walt Chamberlain and Dre West and uh, Elgin Baylor. You know, the early 80s 76ers, particularly the 83 team that had Doc and Moses and Bobby Jones and those guys. Uh, Andrew Toney. You know, of course, the Lakers, that, that was probably the, the they are probably the definition of a super team. The 80s Lakers.
I mean, they had about they had about four or five guys who were in the Hall of Fame. Same thing with the Boston Celtics in the mid in the mid '80s, particularly the '86 team that had Bill Walton on it. Those are super teams. The team that Jordan played on uh, was a was a good team with a great system and a, a all time great player. But no, they were not a super team. We talking about lamenting super teams? That's one, two. Time. And let me say this quickly because you know before uh, Kellerman goes further into his rant, you know, there's this, uh, there's this old wives tale that's going on around the internet. Uh, once again, amongst people who try to promote the Jordan versus Kobe or Jordan versus LeBron debate, quote unquote debate, that the Bulls won 57 games in, in the 93 season and then Jordan retired and they, and they won 55 the next year. Also, uh, Jordan was only worth two games. No. In the 93 season, they coasted through the regular season because Jordan and Pippen were coming off of the Olympics uh, in the off season, right before that season, and they didn't go hard. All right, the year before that, they had won sixty-seven games. So, in the in the ninety-one ninety-two season, they won sixty-seven games, and then the ninety-two ninety-three season, they won fifty-seven games because they coasted through the regular season. And then he retired, and then they brought in Tony Kukoc, they brought in Steve Kerr, they brought in Luke Longley, they brought in. A lot of the guys who would be be very important role players in the second three P team, they brought in in the offseason after Jordan retired. So what they had with that 93, 94 team, including Tony Kukoc, they had the best players from the first three P team with the best players on the second three P team minus Rodman. And they played every game in the 93, 94 season like it was game seven because they were trying to prove that they were just not a bunch of scrubs that were led by Jordan. So that's why they won 55 games. Right? They were a very limited team that had trouble scoring. And, you know, you see these guys, well, you know, they went to the Eastern Conference Finals that, you know, they didn't. They lost in the second round of the playoffs to the Knicks. Okay? Now we can talk about Hugh Hollins' call in Game 5 and the viability of, of them getting past the Knicks uh, had he not made that call. You know, if ifs and buts was candies and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. Uh, they lost, and that was that. Uh, Jordan came back a year and a half later, and they won 72 games. Nobody says, oh, they went from a 45-win team to a 72-win team when Jordan came back. So please don't, please don't try to promote that old wives' tale about how they only lost two fewer games after he retired, you know, as if you're making a point. Right? You're not making a point. You're, you're only showing that you have no, no sense of context. I'm out, Mike. You have owned the Charlotte franchise for longer than the Warriors have been good or have had any of these players, as a matter of fact. So if there's a super team, why isn't it in Charlotte? That's on you. Don't cry because the, cause, cause the Warriors put together a super team or there's only one LeBron. Go get LeBron. And if you can't, you construct a super team like they did it, 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 with the Warriors. And by the way, that, those aren't the only two good teams in the league. But Charlotte is consistently not an elite team, hasn't been an elite team ever under Jordan's ownership. So it takes a lot of nerve for the best who ever did it, who played on super teams, to come out and say who's an owner while other teams are becoming super teams. It's not like Oakland is so much more desirable than Charlotte, right, As in terms of being a market. Uh, well, look, uh, Max Kellerman is making a lot of valid points in regards to building a team. Jordan has came up short. He's come up short as an owner. There's no doubt about that. I think it took him a while to understand that the things that he could see as a player do not necessarily translate over into um, effectiveness as an owner. And, and he, he's made strides in, in uh, divesting power and influence to other people. I believe he hired somebody named Rich Cho who has helped him uh, make the Hornets respectable. But, you know, a lot of becoming a, a super team is, is the luck of the draw. I mean, when you talk about a super team, what happened with the Warriors, nobody predicted that. Nobody predicted that. Now, we could talk about their scouting and things of that nature. Uh, of course, you know, when you can pick out a Draymond Green in the second round, when you can get a Klay Thompson, and when, you, when you're lucky enough to get a, a, a Steph Curry, you know, nobody predicted Steph Curry to be a multiple MVP award winner. Nobody predicted that Klay Thompson would be the best defender at his position in the NBA or Draymond Green. All right. So a lot of times those things, they just they just happen like the Warriors team that 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 just came out of nowhere. 
I mean, in the history of the NBA, this, it's hard to find a team that you can say is akin to, to them. Maybe the, the late 80s Pistons in regards to a team that built itself from the draft and then just added one great player. And, uh, you know, first an Adrian Dantley and then Mark Aguirre, and then they just went on to win championships. That's who I would compare these Warriors to uh, the most. But, um, I mean, it's very hard to, to, to build a team like, you know, that, that, that is a super team. But I do understand what Max Kellerman is saying, and a lot of his points are definitely valid. Uh, Michael has to make better decisions in the back office, and you know, or in the fr- in the front office. Pardon me. And you know, they just have to draft better. They have to find a way to lure free agents to Charlotte, if at all possible. I think really what he's lamenting is not so much the super team. I think what he's lamenting is is uh, the buddy buddy system where a lot of these players are buddying up with each other. And he doesn't have a player on his team that can draw another great player to the team. It takes a lot of nerve for Jordan to complain about this, Stephen A. Well, it takes a lot of nerve to you to complain about him because you need to know what you're talking about. First of all, when you talk about a super team, let's be clear, that wasn't the issue the first three feet. That wasn't what happened. I recall Scottie Pippen needing to be developed. I recall Scottie Pippen not being ready. Now, I love me some Scottie Pippen, and he's one of the greatest ever. I give him mad love and respect. He's a six-time champion. There is no question that Michael Jordan would not have won those championships without Scottie Pippen. I am not trying to disrespect him at all, but he is no MJ, and he had to develop into being the champion that he was because Michael Jordan had to carry that load, not just in terms of being on the basketball court, but having the mental toughness, the psyche to compete against those bad boy pistons. Absolutely. Uh, But, you know, Stephen A. got right to the point. Those Bulls teams were not super teams. Definitely not the first team. If you think I'm lying, ask Isaiah and Joe Dumas and Bill Lambert and the no others. Doubt. It was Michael and everybody else. So again, when we talk about a super team, they were super because of MJ. That's number one. Number two, they weren't a super team until after they got Rodman. Prior to that, it was MJ, it was Pippen, and then there were a bunch of supplementary parts. The Paxes of the world, the B.J. Armstrongs of the world, the three-headed monster at the, at the, at the center division, and Cartwright and, and Stacey Horace Grant, and Bill Winnington. Horace Grant was not a star. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Stephen A. Thank you. I have no idea what the hell Max Kellerman is talking about. Horace Grant was not a star. Um, Give me a break. Horace Grant was a very nice role player. He was a nice supplementary piece. He was not a star. Horace, he was was an all-star player. He He made the all-star team one time in 1994. Okay? Give me a break. He was not a star. Period. When we He's talk about who you wanted team, in power, excuse forward. me, we listen. We listen to you. Just stop it. You're embarrassing yourself. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Just shut his dumb ass up. Thank you, Stephen A. Just shut his dumb ass up, please. The man, man, Horace Grant was a nice complimentary piece. He made one All Star game that same year in a '94 when all the Bulls players they was playing every regular season game like it was Game Seven. B.J. Armstrong made the all-star team that year. Like, they, give me a break. Even talking about this. Anybody knows that Horace Grant was not a star. Stop it. It wasn't true. Mm, I like him. He was a good player. Good player. He, was a, he was a good player. Thank you. He was a nice role player. He was not a star, okay? And if you want to know what questions exist about Horace Grant, no disrespect whatsoever, but could you give up the ball fast enough to a guy like, oh, who was it, Paxson? I think it was Paxson. When you pass that ball against Phoenix? Absolutely. In the 93 finals against Phoenix, that dude, Horace Grant, I'll never forget this shit, that shit. That man had like three games in the finals in 93 where he only had 1.1 rebound. And, and like Stephen A. said, when, uh, when Jordan brought the ball down, and it hit all five players' hands. That man, Horace Grant, moved that ball. He, he kicked that ball out so fast to John Paxson. It was like it was like a hot potato, man. I mean, my Lord, you talk about having a hot... That was a, di- that was a different definition of a hot hand. It's like a hot potato. Let me get the ball out of my hand. Thank, thank you, sir. My hands were good. Just stop it, okay? So this is basketball. That wasn't him. It wasn't a super team until the second 3 P. And by the way... 
When you look at Michael Jordan, he was retired, came out of retirement, only played 17 games in a regular season, and then came back, they got Robin, had the all-time record, and then three-peated. I get what your point is about super teams, but it wasn't like he needed to formulate that in order to capture a first championship like LeBron did. Thank you, sir. In order to capture a first championship like Kevin Durant did. No, Michael Jordan put in the work and did it first. Three He's the best who ever did it. And then the second go round, he just, they got a super team. So don't give me no super He's teams. The like best he, who ever he, did it. Hold and that and, and let me say this. Going into the ninety five, ninety six season. Um, it was viewed that they needed a power forward. Why is that? Because the Bulls lost in the 95 playoffs in the second round. They lost to Orlando, and Horace Grant played very well. Why? Because Phil Jackson decided that he was going to make Horace Grant beat them, and they basically left Horace Grant wide open for the only thing that he could really do offensively, which was make you know 14-foot, 13-foot jump shots. That was part of their game plan because the Bulls had nobody playing power forward. I think they had like Corey Blunt at power forward or some shit like that. And uh, Horace Grant just, all he did was make wide open 14-foot uh, jump shots. So they realized they had to bring in a power forward. It, it, was, it worked out perfectly because um, Dennis Rodman had burned all his bridges in San Antonio. Uh, he came to Chicago and he was the difference that they needed. Like, I mean, you can make a case that, that Dennis Rodman should have been a co-MVP in those 96 finals. He was that, he was that dominant in the 96 finals against uh seattle hold it don't Him, give me my michael point. jordan hold scotty it, pippen hold it, hold it, hold it. grant and shoot a minute super team. Oh, stop it just that you're embarrassing yourself the point is this michael jordan three-peated before there was ever a super team that could be associated with his name which gives him the qualifications to make the statement he made because he didn't do what they did in order to get a ring he had three and then had a super team and let me say this, uh, Michael Jordan also took the Detroit Pistons, the 89 Pistons, to six games with a Scottie Pippen and a Horace Grant in their second year. Um, Scottie Pippen, that was his first year as a starter, and Horace Grant was still platooning uh, um, with Brad Sellers in regards to who's going to be their starting power forward. Like, I mean, come on. Like, that, that whole super team thing, you can't do that with Jordan. I mean, to me, to be quite honest with you, it's borderline if the second 3P team... W would qualify as a super team you know i mean they had cool coach they had robin they had pippen they had michael jordan but what really made them a super team was how they gelled so well together in that system and the magnetism uh, of the star power that they generated through jordan pippen and robin no one is as good as michael jordan no one is good as michael jordan there's no doubt i said the team i said the team but then in the second term you don't deny Great point, Stephen A. Max Kellerman basically stated that, um, you know, who wants to go to Oakland? Well, Oakland is in the Bay Area. That is a very up-and-coming area. You don't have to necessarily live in Oakland. There are a lot of affluent areas uh, around that area that you can live. As a matter of fact, I believe that the highest cost of living right now is in San Francisco. So there are a lot of places, there are a lot of attractive things about the Bay Area that would draw people out there, especially opportunities for athletes in regards to, um, to uh, you know, to start up apps and things of that nature, which is one of the things that Kevin Durant is involved with. Hey, 
now. You got cats acting up. They don't, they don't align in terms of their behavior. They don't align just right. Charlotte gets rid of you. They, 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 let, they allow the franchise to walk away rather than tolerate knuckleheads on their squad. It Absolutely. Uh, Larry Johnson and uh, Alonzo Mourning, they tried to bring a lot of that, you know, that, that, that quasi-thug uh, hip-hop <laughs> energy to Charlotte back in the mid-90s, and they got rid of them dudes. It's different being in a Bible Belt. I'm not excusing the struggles that he had early on. Please don't get me wrong. Fellas, what I'm simply saying, up. however, he got to take all of that into consideration. There's reasons as to why he isn't going to state. Mike, he has his ownership game up, Mike. Either. Get your ownership game up, Mike. Don't complain. Don't cry. You win. Well, look. Quite frankly, I think that Kellerman makes some valid points. Uh, Michael Jordan is going to have to find a way around it because it's not going to change. They're going to have to draft better. Uh, Golden State, you, know, you might call them a super team. They built the vast majority of their, you know, of their players through the draft. They drafted most of their players, and they were able to make themselves a viable option for Kevin Durant, who fit perfectly into their system. So I agree with Kellerman in regards to that. Uh, Michael does have to improve his, his style of ownership. Stephen A. makes a great point. As I already stated, the Bulls were not a super team. It's definitely not the first uh, three-peat team. The second three-peat team, you can make the case that they were a super team. But, you know, you, you had other teams in that era that also had star power. All right. Anyway. All right. So now let's see what Skip and Shannon have to say about the Michael Jordan situation. Next up, the Thunder, Rockets, and Celtics all beefed up their rosters with superstars this offseason to try and compete with Golden State. The Warriors are huge favorites to defend their title as the season tips off next week. But Michael Jordan thinks super teams are bad for the league. Here's what Jordan said in an interview with Cigar, Cigar Aficionado. I think it's going to hurt the overall aspect of the league from a competitive standpoint. You're going to have one or two teams that are going to be great and another 28 teams that are going to be garbage or they're going to have a tough time surviving in the business environment. Shannon? I wonder when Cigar Aficionado will let your boy come on in there and be on the really? Wow. You know really? You see his eyes, Skip? See, you want to know that. my joke. I see, I wrote it. I made a note to myself uh, to make a joke. I'll come still now. It's all right. Hey, Skip, you wonder, I know you're wondering. Why aren't your eyes as dark as Michael Jordan? You can see his eyes dark because he'd be on that yak in the mouth like I do. No, I want to know, what did Michael Jordan do to you that you're always talking about the man like that, Shannon? Uh, did you walk into one of Michael Jordan's parties back in the 90s and he took your woman? Is that what happened, brother? This man is always talking about Michael, <laughs> Michael Jordan. You know what I'm saying? I mean, God damn. Because you don't actually smoke one? No, no, see, I, what I do, I sleep with a Billy Rubin blanket. <laughs> You know, when babies are born with jaundice, they put them in that Billy Ruby. You know what I'm talking about, Joy. They put, I sleep with one every night and make sure my eyes nice and white. Teeth nice and white. You know, so that, that's what I do. That's why I'm like that. But anyway, well, back to I, I hope Michael's watching right now and he, he learned how to... You should, send him, you should send him a blanket. Yeah, I need to send him a Billy Ruby blanket. Mm. Is MJ right? You know, I already mentioned this before, but, you know, it's just interesting to me that, uh, you know, Shannon is, is um, you know, he's enjoying his status as... You know, one of the one of the television heroes of the pro blackity blacks, but he's decided to take on this character that smokes black and miles and, and drinks Hennessy straight out the bottle. Yeah, it's very interesting. He is. Mm. Trash is a little hard, harsh though, skill. Garbage. He should have said recyclables. You know what I'm saying? He's absolutely right. And what has transpired, Skip, is that when Michael played, guys couldn't move like this. That's exactly what it was. Um, you know, it's easy to, to look back and say that the, the players back then stuck things out. Well, the players back then didn't have options. You know, if Michael Jordan had a four-year rookie contract or things of that nature, a three-year rookie contract, and, you know, in 1987 or 88, he could leave if he wanted to, and he didn't like uh, what the Bulls were doing in upper management, who knows? He might have went to go play with Boston or Detroit or something of that nature. Who knows? Yes, and guys are willing to move now, and he's like, well, why would a guy leave 30 million or 40, 50 million on the table? This is why, once again, like I always say, people are a product of their generation. Okay? This is why I reject a lot of the notions that people put forth about Jordan and how Jordan didn't speak up or he didn't speak out. Uh, you have to judge people by their era. Okay? You, you can't compare LeBron James to Michael Jordan and say, oh, LeBron James does all this, he speaks out, Jordan doesn't. Uh, LeBron James speaks is is um, conducting himself according to his era. 
Michael Jordan conducted himself according to his era. Guys just didn't do that back then in the 80s. Like they didn't get on TV and talk about race and things of that nature. I remember Isaiah Thomas damn near lost. <laughs> he damn near, you know, got thrown under the bus just for agreeing with something that Dennis Rodman said about Larry Bird. When Dennis Rodman said if Larry Bird was black, he just, he'd be just another player. And uh, Isaiah Thomas agreed. And they ran him through the mud over that. That was back in uh, 87. You know, so guys just didn't talk like that back then because, it, you know, it just, you know, it just wasn't what they did. They were, That was the forefront, the vanguard of the, um, you know, the branding era, the corporate branding era. And the things that Jordan did in establishing himself as a corporate brand reverberate down to this day, as I've already stated before. What he did and the blueprint that he laid out is the reason why a guy like a LeBron James or a Steph Curry can go on the Internet and talk shit about Donald Trump. Because they know that they have a hundred million dollar sneaker contracts that they can fall back on. That's because of what Michael Jordan did. So when people try to land base Jordan, look, everybody has their gifts. Some people are great orators. Some people are great businessmen. Um, some people are, are, are great in regards to, um, to interpersonal relations. All right? What Jordan did has affected not just the so-called black athlete, but all athletes in regards to their ability to monetize themselves away from their chosen sports field of endeavor. And uh, he should be acknowledged for that, as opposed to people trying to lambaste him for not being Muhammad Ali. Once again, Muhammad Ali is a singular case that, uh, that never existed before him and will never exist after him. For a man to join a, a separatist organization and be unapologetic about it, that has never been done before or since. Colin Kaepernick is not a member of a separatist organization. He's a member of an anarchist organization, that being so-called Black Lives Matter, all right, which is who I believe he's plugged into. So when you compare Kaepernick to Muhammad Ali, that is, you know, that is an, uh, those two things are not equivalent in any way, shape, or form to me. Because guys are getting 20 and $30 million shoe contracts to help offset some of the money that they might be leaving on the table by going to a better situation. You got Clay Thompson. Now he just signed to what? An $80 million sneaker deal, basically $10 million a year for the next eight years. So he's looking at it like this. Now I could go somewhere and I can make 35, I can make 30, 35 million a year, or I can stay in Golden State, win probably two, three, four over the next eight years mm -hmm. and make 28 million. And that's not even counting the deals that he'll get um, in Silicon Valley that we don't know about. These are the things that I'm sure Joe Lacob is assisting his players in, in um, you know, making business uh, relationships, establishing business relationships with the people out there. It's very, very easy to make 200, 300, 400 million in the development of the newest app that's going to pop off and be the biggest thing, you know. When you sign on to become an investor in the next Snapchat or Instagram, you, be, you can become a billionaire overnight. 35, I'm not going to win. 28, I'm going to win. And guess what? Still, everybody's still going to know who I am. Because look at Russell. Look at the market that he's playing in. Do we not know who Russell is? Can Russell not go right? Does he have a global brand? And that's what we're seeing. These guys, and I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. This is what I like. The NFL, we have no idea who's going to the Super Bowl. Yeah, but you know what? Um, I understand what Shannon's going with that. But the thing with the NFL is it's almost too much of a turnover every year with the NFL. Um, I, li I like, the, I like the, the, um, the model of teams building through the draft, uh, establishing dynasties, and then having to be knocked off. That's the era that I, ca that I grew up in as a small child watching sports and then as a teenager well, uh, watching kind of the end of that era with the, um, you know, with the Bulls, and then you can make a case with the uh, Lakers with Kobe and Shaq, you know. But when I, you know, when I first started watching football, it was the very end of the Forty Nine er dynasty, and then of course after that you had the Cowboys uh, in football, and you had the Bulls in basketball. You know that 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 cycle of building a team through the draft and seeing a team mature, and you know get the, get on the top of the hill, and have other teams have to come and knock them off. Um, that's something that I miss in sports, particularly football, because there's so much of a turnover now with the way that the, you know, with the way that, that their system is set up, where they really cannot, they cannot hold on to talented players anymore. They, football now, basically, you have a bunch of teams where, 
you know, all these teams are flawed. You don't have teams that have good defenses and good offenses anymore. I mean, every once in a while, if you get lucky, you'll get a team like a Kansas City uh, that that can kind of approximate a good offense and defense. But you don't really get that like you used to because you can't keep guys anymore. Like Seattle, the Seahawks was supposed to be a dynasty, but they couldn't keep a lot of their players. None. Zero. We thought the Patriots, we mm-hmm. talked about it, like they won the Super Bowl, mm-hmm. they geared up in the offseason, got, seemed like they got strong on offense and defense. We Here we are five weeks, we still don't know. We feel very comfortable to say it. Golden State's going to be playing someone from the Eastern Conference, and it's probably going to be Cleveland or Boston. Wait a minute, Shannon. I thought you said that um, Kyrie ain't going to do anything in, the, in the, this season. It'll show you right there. Shannon knows that that team is going to be wrecking with. Uh, he know he know what Kyrie could do. That's what we are. Skip, we aren't even playing a game. We're five games into the NFL season, and we still don't know. They haven't wrapped up the preseason in basketball, and we have a fairly good idea. So the fans in, in all these cities that... But the thing about basketball, basketball is always going to be a little different because um, the players play both offense and defense. So it's a little less... Uh, uh, it's a little less margin for you know for obscurity in regards to trying to figure out who's going to win because the the most dominant players are going to play well on both ends you don't have to worry about you know you don't have to take your best player off of the field or off of the court for half the game like you do in football with with a Tom Brady or an Aaron Rodgers all right so but in basketball the team with the best two players and definitely the team with the best three players is going to win the championship is that that are not barring injury are not going to stay that are not Cleveland, that are not Boston, they're excited. But what about, like he's talking about, he knows Charlotte, never going to compete. Brooklyn, these teams are not going to compete because the big superstars are not going to go there unless they're other superstars. How do you attract them? You're not winning. You don't have a superstar. So what Michael said is absolutely right. And the worst thing about the, the predicament that Jordan's in, and this is why he's truly lamenting it, is because his teams are not going to be bad enough to drop high enough to bring in the talent that they need to develop to, um, to lower in free agents. With a guy like a Kemba Walker and the players that they brought in, uh, Nicholas Batum, they're basically going to be a 500 team. They're not going to be good enough to lower in free agents, top-notch free agents, and they're not going to be bad enough to draft the top-notch uh, prospects. So, Was he harsh in his critique? But that's, that is a reason why, that's one of the reasons why, and I thought it was a great move that the NBA made to change the draft lottery process um, to kind of incentivize winning and to, um, and to take away the incentive behind tanking. Yes, but he told the absolute gospel truth. Mm. I can't tell you how much I disagree with every point you just made. But let me get back first to Michael Jeffrey Jordan, whom I got to know and covered in Chicago when he was not just a bull, he was the bull. Skip always, you know, sitting around trying to act like he like he used to sleep over at Michael Jordan's house and drink hot chocolate with marshmallows with him or some shit. You covered him for one season, man. Like Michael probably like, oh, I remember that little white boy. Yeah, he used to be all up in my locker <laughs> trying to steal my cigars. You know, Skip, Michael, remember me? Uh, you signed my, my notepad back in 98. I still have it. It's right under my bed. Bull and the player in the history of this league, in the history of sports, I've never been around a greater competitor, a greater performer under pressure. Agreed. That's why Jordan is the greatest team sport athlete to ever play. Uh, nobody ever I've, that I've ever seen in sports uh, always rose to the occasion like him. Never seen it uh, from any other athlete. Not even close. And in those days, that Michael Jordan would have said to this, bring it on. You know, I'll just stay here by myself, and you guys load up over there, and you load up over there, and I'll kick all your behind. And he just wouldn't beat them. Here. And he ain't going to beat them. He would have beaten them. Oh, you, you, do you remember what happened with the Big Three in Chicago? Yeah. When they were loaded up, he couldn't beat them. You, no, you mean Big Three where? In Chicago and, and, and Celtics. In Celtics. And when the Lakers had he, that he thing He was going? just a child. He was just starting. And, and they were... I don't know why Shannon keeps trying to promote this fallacious argument that, that um, you know, Jordan couldn't beat those. Like Skip says, I mean, come on, there's a process and there's a maturation that has to occur. When you're talking about a Larry Bird, 
or a, um, a Magic Johnson who are both four or five years deep into their NBA careers with Hall of Famers playing around them and a Michael Jordan that came into a, a Chicago team that had no heritage of winning at all. You know, people always talk about how LeBron fought, uh, brought the first championship to Cleveland. Well, Michael Jordan brought the first championship to the Chicago Bulls. All right. Uh, Chicago was not a city that was known for winning. The Cubs never won shit uh, while he was there. And for years before he was there, the Bears had only won one Super Bowl. And it was actually during Jordan's first season with the Bulls. You know, when the 85 Bears won. Like, I mean, Jordan was the one who really brought a winning element to, to Chicago. Veterans. Do you believe them? With that team, the way they constructed right now, Golden State. You believe Michael Jordan could have beat that team? With yeah, my- I do. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you, then you don't get it. You, you don't oh, get, I get what it. this guy was. If, if you had, he, he still had Rodman, and he still had Pippen, and he still had Harper, and I have never seen a more suffocating defense than the 98 Bulls played. You couldn't get the ball across half court against him, and I would say good luck to this Golden State team. Uh, let me say this. With a, full, a fully healthy 97 Bulls team, fully healthy, um, playing under 90s rules, they would, they would beat Golden State. It would be a tough series, but they would beat them. Now, under these rules, Golden State would most likely beat Chicago because of the shooting. Um, but, you know, if they met in the finals, the NBA would probably have a lot more physicality. But the, the way that Golden State could stretch the floor shooting threes, it would have been, it, it been something alien to Chicago to have to deal with that. They, they, there wasn't any teams back then who could shoot the long ball that well. Now, they did deal with a team who sh- that shot a lot of long balls in 93 when they played Phoenix. Seattle shot the long ball pretty well in 96, but to this degree, no. And then today, you know, guys pull up from three off the dribble. You know, a guy like a Kevin Durant, Scottie Pippen would have had to guard him. Michael would have had to guard Clay, and, and uh, you would have had to have Ron Harper on Steph Curry. And, of course, Draymond and Dennis Rodman, that would have been the battle of the nut jobs. So, I mean, who knows? But that would have been a great series. Team. Just on toughness, they couldn't have stopped this guy for sure. Okay, let me ask you a question. He would have terrorized. Are they playing team. ninety-eight rules? Or are they playing current rules? Ninety-eight rules. Okay, well now, well that team, with well, ninety-eight, you couldn't put that team okay. together. So, so back to your point you made about New England. I've been doing this for a long time, and every time you say somebody is a prohibitive favorite, life always happens. Mm-hmm. And I'd never seen anything like how prohibitively favored New England was coming into this football season. Now, the injury factor is a little higher in football, just a little higher yeah. than it is in basketball, but there's still an injury factor. And I'm, I'm knocking on wood. I'm not wishing it on anybody. Yes, you are. Stop lying. You are wishing injury on Golden State because you know that that's really the only way that you can beat them. You can talk about Kawhi and, and Zaza for cheap shot and all that shit that you want to talk about. You know damn well that this team has a year of experience under their belt. They're going to be a different and a better team. They're going to be harder to defeat this year uh, for your Spurs. So, yes, you are rooting for somebody to go down. Body, mm-hmm. But when you least expect it, an injury happens. Julian Edelman's gone for the year? Oh, wait a minute. Dante Hightower, something, he, he tore I think he needs knee surgery. He's just trying to get through it right well, they now. Moved, well, they moved, yeah. Skip, he played middle. Now they put him on the edge. It's, it's just he's not right. Okay. So he's the driving force of the defense, and all of a sudden this happens, and Gronk's not quite right as we suspected he might not be right. But they, they look like they won the Super Bowl and won the offseason, and it still doesn't matter because they're, what are they, 3-2, and two, yes. and they're tied with the Jets and tied with the Bills, and now people are saying the Jets have a shot to beat them this Sunday at – yeah, but you know it's a long season. You know, I mean they're three and two. The Patriots are the type of team that could win their last eleven games, especially with that full Brady. At Jets, no, they don't. Okay, well they don't. <laughs> I, I, I agree, but that's where we are right yes. now because that was the prohibit. No team has ever been a bigger favorite in the National Football League than this team was coming into this year. Correct. Right. Oh, interesting. So now let's get down to twenty-eight garbage teams. So I assume Michael is suggesting that. You got Golden State in the West, and you have, I guess he means Cleveland in the East, Correct. period, end of story. So, do I give the San Antonio Spurs a shot to win it all this year? You better believe I do. And I'm gonna... Yeah, but you know what? When Michael says that, you know how Michael is. Michael is, you know, he's the ultimate fatalist. Like, he's just dealing directly with who he thinks is going to come out of the West and the East. He doesn't give San Antonio a real chance. Like, Michael just gets straight to the point, you know? He doesn't give a shit about about all this, all the decoration. 
you know, Jordan understands that if Golden State is healthy, they're going to come out of the West again, and Cleveland's going to come out of the East. And he sees that it's basically an arms race. It's, it's like uh, the U.S. versus Russia, and, and all the other teams are just third world countries, you know, just, just waiting to see who's going to win so that they can, you know, beg to be a vassal for the winner. I'm going to get back to them in just a second. Do I give Houston a shot this year to dethrone? I give them a shot. Do I give Oklahoma City a long shot shot? I give them a long shot shot. And in the Eastern Conference, do I give Boston a shot to dethrone the Cavs? Yes, I do. Do I give the Miami Heat a shot? Just a shot. Yeah. Is it realistic that they could compete with Cleveland? Yeah. The aging Cavaliers. You want to talk about injuries waiting to happen? I'm knocking on wood. I'm not wishing it upon them. But you got so many aging veterans. Things could happen. They I agree with that. Um, uh, Cleveland is my favorite to get out of the East. Uh, as long as LeBron is there and in a, in a conference that is that devoid of talent and experienced players actually advancing in the playoffs, they're the favorite. But it wouldn't shock me, man. They have a lot of old players, and they have a lot of players who, um, you know, the game has kind of passed them by. D-Wade is still an effective player, but the game is kind of passing by. Uh, you know, they're going to be a team that's going to be trying to match two-point shots with three-point shots. They get Derrick Rose and... and um, and and D Wade, you know they're basically the same kind of player slashers who want to just uh, make long twos or try to finish at the rim and get fouled. Like uh, the way that Golden State plays, it's just going to be a little too much for Cleveland. So it it would it would not shock me if if uh, Cleveland got got you know if they got knocked off in the playoffs by one of these teams. Who knows? One team that I'm going to be watching out for this year is Philly. I want to see how they gel. Things can go wrong. Chemistry can't happen. Dwayne's kind of on his last legs. I don't know what's going to happen with them. They're all teetering. LeBron's in his 15th season, so you can't book it. You can't book Golden but, State. And, and, and here's what I'm going to remind everybody of this because nobody wants to accept it. Game one of the Western Conference Finals last year. Get this through your head. It's San Antonio at Golden State, where, by the way, San Antonio won the first game of the last regular season by 29 points. So they like playing there. They are up 23 points in the third quarter. Why was that? Because Kawhi Leonard had a coming out party last year and turned into the best two-way player. He used to be the best defensive player only. I will say this. Kawhi was very dominant in that game before he got hurt. He was dominating them. Uh, so it's going to be interesting, interesting to see how he plays this year. Uh, I, w I believe that LeBron will be the sentimental favorite for MVP, but I think that they'll be looking for somebody to give them a reason to not give it to LeBron. I stated years ago that when LeBron won the MVP in 2013 that they were going to try to not give it to him again because they didn't want the league to come off as being just a LeBron James league with everybody else, you know, just uh, you know, just orbiting around his son. So, they have given a lot of these other players time to develop and mature and and they've done a good job of it. Now you have a James Harden, a Steph Curry, a Russell Westbrook, uh, Kevin Durant, a Kawhi Leonard. You know they have a diversity of guys that are viable MVPs now. So they like that. This is remember this is all narrative. This is uh, entertainment, like a TV show. So they see that one character is on his way out. That being LeBron, they have to start building up uh, supplemental characters. But last year they finally convinced him shoot it, and he was shooting the hell out of it because he'd scored at that point in Game One at Golden State. 26 points. Look at Shannon's face. Shannon ain't even listening to Skip. He's too busy looking at the monitor, looking at looking at his his boo LeBron. Look at this. I'm gonna rewind it back. Six points. But last year they finally convinced him shoot it, and he was. Look at look at Shannon. Shannon's Shannon's totally focused on the monitor. He was shooting the hell out of it because he'd scored at that point in Game One at Golden State, 26 points with. Go ahead, baby. You go ahead and shoot, just like we did in the gym earlier this morning. Make sure you ice that ankle, like I told you. With eight rebounds, he had made all 11 of his free throws, because he makes all of his free throws. In game one last year, he made 15 out of 15 free throws. He was dominating the team that you say, say it says is invincible. Really? So he gets hurt, Zaza Pacheep shot happens, and he's gone for the rest of the series. You can't tell me San Antonio would have just folded the rest of the way. They would have won that game, and I would have loved to have seen game two at Golden State 
because it would have been a barn burner. All the pressure on the home team. Let's see if they fold. You see, the difference between football and basketball is if I get you down like that, I win a game. It's over. There is no tomorrow. I do not see a team in the Western Conference beating the Golden State Warriors four games over a two-week span. I agree. They just have too much talent, man. I mean, they got two. They got. They have arguably two of the top three players in the NBA. Now, certain people might not put Steph Curry in the top three. I do. I think he's arguably the top two. I don't think that it's definite that Durant is better than him. Some people might disagree with it. At the end of the day, he won a championship without KD. KD has never won without him. All right? Then he came back and had uh, maybe the most dominant MVP season. And, you know, maybe since LeBron's 2013 MVP season. That's how dominant it, it was. Um, uh, Steph Curry was was awesome in 2016. And I believe that he definitely can, you can argue him as the second best player in the NBA or the second most impactful player in the NBA. But I will put KD at number two. I will probably make Steph 2A. You know, if I say that KD's 1A to LeBron's 1, I will make Steph 1B. I mean, to me, it's that close. And then probably Kawhi, you know, a 2. But there's people who I'm sure believe that Kawhi is, is more valuable than Curry. You know, and then, of course, you got the Westbrook fans. But, you know, that's, that's neither here nor there. I, and that's what Michael is talking about, Skip. You, you know what? Here, here's the amusing part of Michael. So, once upon a time, he was the greatest player in any sport ever. Then, 11 years ago, he took over the Charlotte franchise. And guess what's happened in 11 years? Michael Jordan could not do upstairs what he could do out on the court. Because they have made the playoffs three times in 11 years, and they've gone out in the first round right. all three times. And over that 11-year span that he's been running that franchise, they have the fifth worst record in the entire NBA, tied with the New York Knicks. Well, I mean, let's let's understand something. If you don't have the um, if you don't have a proper general manager, you're not going to get the job done through the draft. They've been very fortunate. Uh, when I say they, I mean teams like uh, OKC. San Antonio, Golden State, they've been very fortunate to have great GMs. You know, Bob Myers, uh, what's this guy's name, uh, uh, R.C. Buford. You know, those guys have done a phenomenal job scouting, uh, not just in America and in, in these colleges, but also overseas. Jordan had to learn the hard way that he has to divest power and influence in his team and in the day-to-day uh, -day goings on of the team to somebody else. And that's that's how they become respectable. Now, the next step is is drafting properly. And they may have to let a lot of these players go, these marginal players go like a Kemba Walker or a Nicholas Batum so that they can bottom out. And, um, you know, hope that they can get a higher draft pick. But then again, now with the way that the NBA has changed the draft process, they, they're going to have to be one of those teams that just missed the playoffs in order to get a high draft pick. So they're kind of stuck in a conundrum. So, as I always tell you, the greatest players often make the worst upstairs, the GMs, the, the personnel directors. Yes. So, Michael's not very good at, at building a championship team in Charlotte. Skip, if you look at it, look at Coach Belichick. Coach Belichick got right twice. He got Tom Brady, but he didn't know what he had with Tom. No. And he got Gronk in the second round. But you look at the rest of his picks. It's not like every year he hits. Now, you look at Ozzie Newsom. He drafted four first ballot Hall of Famers. He got Osborne, mm -hmm. he got Ray Lewis, he got Ed Reed, he got Terrell Suggs. Skip, you never know. You hope like, okay, this guy can't miss. You don't know. You don't, I don't care what the sport is. You really don't know what you have until you get that guy in your mm -hmm. locker room, in your uniform, mm -hmm. and he has to go into the... I know, but... I agree with that. But, you know, certain guys you kind of know are can't miss guys. Like LeBron was, you know, was a can't miss guy. You kind of knew that. Shaq was can't miss. I remember when Shaq got drafted, he was can't miss. Uh, you know, but those guys only come along once every, you know, maybe 10 years or so. You know, Kareem, of course, was can't miss. Magic was can't miss. I know, but, but look at what R.C. Buford has done in small market San Antonio. A guy who, by the way, didn't even play in college. Yeah. So how does he know? How does he know game tape? How does he know what to do? He hits and hits and hits and hits. He hit on Kawhi Leonard. He went and stole Kawhi Leonard yes. from Larry Bird. Yes. Right? You, 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 that happens right? sometimes. It's kind of like Coach Belichick. Well, you know, a guy like a R.C. Buford, is, is, um, he understands what his coach, Popovich, wants. He understands the type of guys who will be easily manipulated. Is a guy who gets off on manipulating players. He likes to manipulate the media with a lot of his liberal rants. 
All right. That's a way to ingratiate himself with the players and a lot of the uh, players from other teams. This is why you, you see so many players speak so laudingly of of Greg Popovich. You, know, you always have to understand when people make statements publicly, it's not always how they really feel. Sometimes it's how they just want to be perceived. Stole Tom Brady in the sixth round. If they thought Kawhi that, that, that wasn't a steal, though, that's just luck. Yeah. That's just like you don't know. You take him in the second round. Yeah, but then what if you thought Kawhi was that? Why didn't you trade up earlier? Why didn't you trade Cause, up? Because that's the best you could do. You're you're trading from t- for what were they? Probably twenty nine or thirty. Yeah, well, you should have gave you should have gave up two first rounders this year and the next one. They didn't know. I mean, Skip, it's easy to say because the way Kawhi, you can tell me. After averaging seven points his first year, you saw this Kawhi? Or can you say after averaging 14? No, come I, on. I, yeah. I watched him at San Diego State in the playoffs and the NCAAs. I didn't see this. Exactly. But R.C. Buford did, and he saw it in Tony Parker, and he saw it in Ginobili. It, it, look at him. Saw it in Patty Mills. Look what he does. It's well, unbelievable. Unless Michael was talking about the Charlotte Hornets, which I'm assuming he wasn't, I don't think I would imagine I'd like hearing that if I was on the team. He li- no, he was talking about Charlotte, too. That type of dude Michael is. Michael's probably, you know, smoking one, <laughs> smoking one of his cigars and drinking. And, you know, he, he got to talking reckless. He ain't like everybody they know. All he did was say what everybody else was afraid of. I know, but he's the owner of the team. You can't say that. Yeah, I'm telling you. But maybe, you know, but, maybe, but you know when maybe I, it was like the Warriors and the Hornets are super that, teams. That, and that's it. Joy, <laughs> you know, on a nice, a warm afternoon, you drinking that yak. You can, he probably got one of them heebles. You know, he might not be on the miles like me, Skip. Mm-hmm. No, he, he goes big. Yeah, I yeah, know he on them old, big old long, them old robust <laughs> mm-hmm. Is there any way Kirk Cousins... But anyway, that's the issue with Jordan uh, and his perceptions on the uh, the 28 other teams that he, he deems to be garbage as opposed to the super teams. But, you know, the overall consensus, I agree with both sides in both debates. Uh, Michael is going to have to step his game up as an owner in regards to his tactics. Um, and at the same time, you know, it is going to hurt the league in the long run. I think that a lot of things are going to hurt the NBA after a while. Stylistically, it's just too many three-pointers that these teams are taking. And uh, and also, a lot of these guys just group, grouping up together with each other. They're going to have to do something to, to try to inhibit that. Because what is going to, what's going to happen is it's going to turn all the other teams in the NBA uh, into a developmental league for, you know, the three or four teams that everybody wants to go to. But anyway, peace.